So I'm going to talk today about a problem uh, that I think is extremely exciting, and I hope you find it exciting as well, uh, because it's a problem that we don't really have a lot of treatment for in this community. And that is a problem of capacity management. And in our case, specifically, how we manage global capacity in our large private cloud. Now, I think that many of us have experienced uh, you know, issues or problems obtaining capacity in public clouds. Right? You might ask for you know, a certain number of VMs, say, and get an error saying, well, we can't actually provision those for you. And in many cases, you might actually be able to get that capacity, but not exactly where you want it. Maybe you don't get it in the region or availability zone that you would actually like your capacity. And of course, you would like your capacity to be there because maybe you have data in that region, or maybe, you have, maybe th that region is close to your users, say. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, cloud providers can't always deliver on, on providing that capacity to you. And you may not be surprised to, to learn that this is actually a problem we have internally as well in our large private cloud of Meta. And so our problem then is this. How do we actually deliver capacity when and crucially where that capacity is needed to our customers, in our case, our internal customers? Now, you might sort of fairly ask, why is this, you know, why is this a challenging problem? Why is it interesting? And I'll go through a few, um, you know, a few kind of key challenges with, um, uh, that we need to solve while solving this overall problem. The first, and, and maybe, maybe kind of gnarliest one, is that we're operating our, um, our global infrastructure by subdividing our capacity into many, many regions. In our case, we operate more than 20 different regions. Um, you know, uh, and, and, and those regions in turn comprise millions of servers serving tens of products, uh, of course, to billions of users, as many of you know. And the way, that, the way that we actually manage this capacity is that we try to route users to the region that's closest to them, right, and that has capacity available for the product that they're accessing in order to give those users a better user experience. And why is this a problem? Why, why does this complicate our capacity management situation? Well, there's a few different aspects of this. The first is that the newer regions um, tend to be the ones that have more headrooms, so in other words, power and space for us to install or order more racks to be installed in. And what that means is, uh, you know, typically that's where we can kind of readily provision capacity to services. And actually because of this, it also means that each region tends to be a kind of, you know, fossil record of what kind of capacity was demanded at the time that that region had av available space and power. And so this leads to sort of variable capacity availability across our regions in terms of the kind of capacity that we're able to provide. So that's one important challenge to delivering capacity in the way we would like. The second one is that when we think about our service workloads, they're highly entangled. And I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate this with an example. So here we have a user um, who's accessing the Facebook website. And they're directed to our Prineville, Oregon region. Now they will land on a, you know, an application server, a web server, but while that has a lot of application logic, it can't do the job on its own, right? And so that server in turn might call to a feed server that constructs the user's news feed, which is kind of the core of the, the Facebook product. Now that in turn composes other services. So maybe it wants to use machine learning to try to rank or recommend items to the user. And in order to do that, you have to retrieve features for both items and users. Um, and the feature serving system in turn might need to use some indices, say, that are shared across other, other systems as well. And finally, once we have our features, uh, we might call into an inference server, right? So as you can see, we have a you know, pretty complex service dependency graph. And by the way, as we show in our paper, it's not uncommon to invoke hundreds or maybe even thousands of services for even simple requests to, you know, to, into our infrastructure. Now, importantly, services are actually entangled in a different way as well. So consider this. You have an Instagram user, they use the Instagram app, that app calls into the Instagram API. And in this case, the user is performing some sort of search, right? They're looking for something. And in order to rank the items that are being searched, that search server too has to, you know, retrieve features for the items being ranked. And it also calls into our inference serving system uh, in order to actually produce scores to produce the kind of ranked uh, uh, search results back to the user. And so it's actually the case that we're not only dealing with one 
sort of dependency graph of services, but actually multiple dependency graphs, each of which are driven by different top-level products, in this case, Facebook and Instagram, but we have tens more. Right? The third challenge that I'll talk about is that we're dealing with heterogeneous hardware. So um, as you can imagine, a lot of our services use kind of bread and butter compute hardware, right? You know, RAM and CPU and so on. But uh, we have other hardware as well. So for example, our index server might want to use flash hardware in order to you know, take advantage of the high storage density of, uh, and, and, and performance offered by flash. And for inference, we might want to use hardware acceleration, right, for all the benefits that that gives us. And this complicates the picture even further now because not only do I have to understand how to manage these services, but I have to correctly match them to the hardware that they actually require. So to tie all of this together, let's consider an example like a new product launch. And so maybe as, as many of you know, last week we launched a new product called Threads, uh, which garnered you know, close to 100 million signups in just a few days. And in order to support such a launch, uh, you know, we obviously need to provide that, that product with the capacity that they need. In this case, Threads was built upon a lot of the existing Inst Instagram infrastructure that we had. And so this might now require us to grow the footprint of, of Instagram, right? And not just Instagram, but the transitive set of dependencies that, uh, that are used by, you know, by, by those APIs. Now, Prineville happens to be one of our mature regions. We don't actually have enough headroom in that region to grow Instagram there without also shrinking some other services, right? So how, the, how might this work? Well, uh, in this case, we may, might need to consider moving our Facebook capacity to a different region that might have that additional headroom. So the way we would actually do that is to shrink you know, the, the, the Facebook capacity that's associated with Prineville and grow it in some other region. And this just sort of uh, you know, maybe is a good example of sort of showing the complexities that are involved in managing capacity that's regionalized in this way at the scale that we're operating. So this is then what I'll call the, the Gordian knot of capacity management, which is that we simultaneously have to provide capacity to the services, to our services, as they grow and change and new features launch and so on and so forth, while respecting these dependency graphs. We can't simply grant capacity to one service without also understanding how that affects the capacity requirements of other services. And we also have to understand what the user traffic distribution is, and also in addition to that, what kind of latency constraints we might need to apply to, um, to granting capacity to these services. And all the while, we have to understand what the supply situation looks like. What is the regional variation of capacity that's available and, hardware, uh, and what hardware is available in which region. And of course, crucially, we have to ensure that we do all of this while um, you know, managing our hardware efficiently. With large uh, hardware footprints like the ones we're operating, you know, even small uh, uh, decreases in efficiency can have a fairly substantial impact in terms of our OPEX and CAPEX. So this then might raise the question, well, okay, so why do we need a system for this? Like, surely we did it some other way before. And, and the, the answer is that yes, we did, but it was all manual. So for example, in the example that I showed you, um, you know, with the, with the launch of threads, we might have had to have teams negotiate manually with each other and kind of barter for capacity, right? across regions where one team might have additional capacity uh, and, and be willing to give up capacity elsewhere and so on. Now, we found that this process does not really scale even to you know, 10 regions, and we're, we're far beyond that point, point now. And in addition to that, it was a highly inefficient process, but it also led to quite uh, substantially suboptimal outcomes. So one, of one thing that we found is that our capacity distribution in terms of you know, capacity allocated to services was highly uneven, and this harmed our sort of DR buffers, right? We had to, we had to allocate a lot more DR buffers than, than we would otherwise need to. And by the way, right after me, Justin will talk about some of our DR work as well. So then that brings us to Flux. And so what is Flux? Um, Flux is sort of organized into three different pillars. So the, the first one is that we build and identify product service models using RPC tracing. So this helps us to understand what is the sort of total capacity allocation to services required by a particular traffic distribution. We then use this model to formulate a joint capacity and traffic placement um, solver. And this helps us now to sort of jointly optimize how we place traffic with how we place capacity. 
And then we implement those plans using a capacity orchestrator. Now this is a short talk, I won't be able to go into all the details, but we'll briefly go over each of these three aspects. So uh, one crucial thing, just in terms of how we contextualize Flux itself and how it fits into our kind of capacity and service management stack is that, uh, you know, like, like most other companies, we run, uh, you know, a cluster management system in each region. Um, and that cluster management system runs on top of a capacity management system. And finally, at the top, we have a traffic management system that determines how to distribute traffic um, you know, across our regions. And by the way, many of these systems have been described in previous papers as well. Now, where Flux kind of uh, fits into this picture is that it, it kind of joins these two worlds of traffic management with capacity management and jointly manage them. Uh, and, and, and you'll see how um, in the remainder of the talk. So uh, I'll first talk about our uh, service modeling with which we use, for which we use RPC tracing. The basic job of service modeling is to try to attempt to attribute um, capacity footprint of services to different top level products. And so in this case, you have one color representing Facebook, another uh, representing Instagram. And we use uh, RPC tracing joined with some cost models for our um, uh, capacity footprints uh, in order to sort of attribute what proportion of a service's footprint is, is sort of dedicated to serving uh, one or the other top level product in this case. And again, keep in mind that I'm keeping this simple by uh, sort of showing two prominent products, but in reality, we have tens of these. Uh, this wouldn't be a talk involving optimization without showing some math. I encourage you to check out the paper if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, we then take this model to effectively formulate a, uh, a, an optimization problem that jointly, jointly places traffic with capacity. And on top of this core model, we can now um, apply several optimization objectives, right? So for example, we can use this to balance um, our spare capacity across regions so that we can respond more quickly to um, you know, capacity shortages, say, uh, without having to worry too much about how that capacity is regionalized. Uh, we can also do things like um, rebalance our capacity in order to minimize our DR buffer needs. And this can be, lead to substantial cost savings as well. And finally, uh, once we have a plan, so this again is an assignment of traffic and capacity jointly, we built a capacity orchestrator that composes on top of our existing traffic and capacity management systems in order to move our infrastructure state from, from its present state to the one that's sort of desired by this, by this plan. And crucially here, uh, we have an orchestrator that's responsible for sequencing a set of actions such that our infrastructure is always in a safe state, meaning that we're always DR ready, fault tolerant in other words, uh, that we always have sufficient capacity provision globally for all of our services given, the, given any sort of traffic distribution um, that represents an intermediate state. And we also use a control plane to kind of disintermediate that orchestrator with the underlying uh, management systems. And that helps us to kind of integrate uh, uh, with you know, new systems as well as to come, uh, as to come along. One crucial aspect of uh, how we do perform orchestration is that we allow for there to be a human in the loop. And uh, we sort of invoke this, this, this human effectively to sometimes ratify decisions if we don't have enough confidence. Uh, for example, if the modeling error is too large. But this was also a crucial aspect to getting Flux off the ground. It allowed us to sort of gradually increase the level of autonomy of the system where, uh, where today we, uh, Flux runs nearly completely autonomously. So in practice, we've been, now been running Flux for three years. Uh, it's been responsible for rebalancing and placing millions of servers worth of capacity. Uh, each, each of these placement plans that I talked about can involve upwards of 300,000 servers. Um, and initially, Flux was used primarily actually for uh, supporting hardware refresh. And so this is when we renew some of the hardware in some of our regions, which then temporarily decreases the amount of total available capacity in that region, and we use Flux to move things around accordingly. Uh, however, more recently, we're now oriented more towards supporting growth and things like this. Now, it should be said that Flux is agnostic to how it is being used. It is, it is kind of an infrastructure optimization tool, uh, and we can deploy it for multiple different purposes. Now, uh, 
some of the challenges that we had in, in deploying Flux are primarily around uh, our, the modeling work. Uh, some of the services that we, uh, you know, th th that we deploy at Meta aren't so easily modeled by Flux, and we go into some of the details uh, of this in the paper as well. And so, so in summary, uh, Flux is our system for managing global capacity. It works by um, you know, constructing or identifying capacity dependency models using RPC tracing, uh, and then formulating an optimization problem to jointly place capacity with traffic, uh, and then finally uh, implements a capacity orchestrator to safely implement those plans. And so that's, that's what I got for now. I'll, I'll leave it over to Justin, and I hope you have good questions for me. All right.